So with Hashem's loving grace, tonight's lesson is entitled Family Fleck. Now, if you remember, our last lesson acquainted us with six types of abusers that we encounter outside the family unit. Now, there's so much verbal abuse within the family unit. That's what we're talking about tonight. And we're going to talk about the type of verbal abuse that unfortunately is all too common in family relationships. So we're going to divide this into three areas. First is the verbal abuse in marriage between spouses. The second is verbal abuse from parents. Kids suffer not only young children, but adult children would suffer from their parents. And the third is the opposite, the verbal abuse that parents suffer from their children. We're going to talk about what, what the, the cause of this, the spiritual cause, everything, nothing happens. It's, it's happenstance. Everything's a cause and effect, spiritual cause and effect. And then what we could do about it, what we could do to improve the situation and what we could do to turn a bad situation into a good situation. Okay, so first we're going to speak about verbal abuse in marriage. Okay, Rabbi Rahumi, the Gemara tells a story about Rabbi Rahumi. Rabbi Rahumi was a humble, wonderful Torah scholar and he was in the Mahoyza Yeshiva in Babylon. And he'd be immersed in his studies all year long. And his wife was so supportive and so honored that uh, she had a husband that was such a Torah scholar. She let him go away from home. He'd learn all year long. But he would come home every every year for Yom Kippur. And say Yom Kippur and Sukkot. And after Simchat Torah, he'd go back to the Yeshiva. Okay, so one Yom Kippur Eve, uh, he was a little bit late. And she would from the beginning, Yom Kippur, for the day before Yom Kippur, early in the morning, uh, she'd wait by the window and look forward to her, her husband coming. She hasn't seen him all year long. And she's looking 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 noon. It's already one in the afternoon. He hasn't showed up yet. Two in the afternoon, three in the afternoon, she was really getting worried. Four in the afternoon, five in the afternoon, candlelighting time was six, an hour before candlelighting time. And she had, she was so upset and so worried and antipassing. One little tear trickled down her eye. One little tear. Okay, this, this guy's a pet attention. This is the Gomorrah, it's not me. That you don't want to sad your wife in any circumstance. Okay, so as soon as she pined so much for her husband, and she didn't want to cry, she didn't want to complain about him, but she shed a tear. And her one tear, it made it all the way up to the heavenly throne. And it was decreed then and there that Rabbi Rahumi would be punished. So as he was, it was almost home, but he fell and he died right then. That right then was decreed. He fell, he died. That was it. And that was a tractate Ksuba 62b. You can see this story right out of the Gemara. Okay, so let's take a closer look at Rabbi Rahumi. We're talking about an impeccably righteous person. Someone that didn't do anything. Everything he did was, was according to Torah. And, and he was so holy that he could, he was capable, his prayers could revive a dead person. Still, it didn't help when it came to bringing sorrow to his wife. Hashem expected more from him at, at his spiritual level, and Hashem punished him. So the Gemara explains that since a woman is built on feelings, men are built on logic. Okay, and sometimes men say to wife, what are you so upset about? You don't understand that she's got strong antenna. She's got very strong feelings. She th feels things that, that we don't necessarily feel. And she quickly feels sorrow and she readily sheds a tear. So therefore the Gomorrah warns that a man should be completely cautious about the way he speaks to his wife. Now, at this point, a, a lot of guys, if I give this shoe, a lot of guys are protest. They say, wait, wait a second. Why doesn't the Gomorrah exercise a woman to caution, to be cautious in the way she speaks to her husband. She's got to respect her husband. And to, you know, this is discriminating. Uh, sorry, guys, there's no discrimination here. A man is required to place reason above emotion. This is what the Torah demands from men, because men are built different from women. And I'm sorry for the women's livers, but this is a fact, the spiritual fact of life. And we get this from the manufacturer that created the Nishoma. The man's soul is built one way a woman's soul is built another they're not the same thing and you can see man cannot bear children and a, a man can't do a thing a woman could do a woman can't do things that a man could do and the shem made is different but a man has to take the lead in refining his character this Hashem expects from us that we have to take the lead okay and so Hashem gives man a lot more arrogance and a lot more streak of violence than he gives to a woman. And 
and lack of patience, that logic, lack of patience, and then they don't have patience that a woman does. And so Hashem, what's he doing? Why is he giving us all this excess negative baggage? Because Hashem wants us to work on ourselves and to refine our character. Because by refining our character and working on ourselves, this gives a positive influence in the atmosphere of a home. You can walk into a home, pay attention. You can walk into a home, and before someone says a thing, you could feel, ah, oh, there's peace in this house, or there's tension. A person feels tense in some place. You can get peace, and that's because of the atmosphere of the marriage, the atmosphere of the home. So outside the home, a man is warned. You can't, every time someone upsets him, he right away gets into a fist fight. He can't yell and he can't shake his fist at anybody that upsets him or opposes him in any way. Imagine the guy at work, uh, every time somebody goes against his will, he goes around hitting people. He's not going to going to have a job. Okay, he'd be an outcast and everybody would avoid him. So if he can't yell and shake fists and threaten people on the outside, why does he have the liberty to do it at home? Ship says, no, young man, you do not have the liberty to do that at home. Just because you're married to that woman and just because you're physically stronger than she, you can't do it. So here, the Me'iri, the Me'iri is one of our medieval commentators on Talmud. And he comes to no, so his commentary, famous commentary on all of Talmud. The Me'iri says, a person should never, a person should always be careful never to shame his wife. Since her tears readily flow, she's readily upset. This one, the Me'iri was commenting on the story of Rabbi Rahumi that, that I told you in Gomorrah and Chapter Exuba. Okay, and a, Mary also warns somewhere when he talks in his elaboration and tractate Bab Matziah, he says, a man must be very careful of his wife's dignity, that he should do anything that's an affront to her dignity. And he gives a proof of that. He says, look, look what it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 16. And Abram benefited in her sake, that by virtue, we learn from that passage in Torah that Abraham's uh, abundance. That was by virtue of Sarah. That by virtue was his wife. Okay. So a husband shouldn't think for a minute that raising his voice or making a hurtful comment is no big deal. It is a big deal because if a husband stops and thinks, what well, I tell guys, I say, listen, stop and think. Uh, your wife's a daughter of the Almighty, right? Okay. If your wife's a daughter of the Almighty, then who's your father-in-law? Oh, you're going to mess with the father-in-law like that? No. He doesn't want you insulting his daughter. Okay, so nobody in their right mind would incur the wrath of a father-in-law like the Almighty. Okay, so women, learn something about women. And why all this? Sorry, guys, but here uh, is one thing, one point in favor of uh, the, the, the women's groups, but they don't know why. They, they, they're wrong, they're, they have maybe the right thing for the wrong reason, but women do have superior spiritual sensitivity. Women can feel a shem much more readily than a man can. That way is the man is required to do so many more mitzvahs than a woman is. Than a woman is okay? A woman, she doesn't need filling. She doesn't need sitzah. She doesn't need prayer three times a day to feel a shem. She just talks to shem all day long. Every day she's eyes, she's a baby, she's a servant making food. She talks to shem all day long. And if she, if she does open up a book of Psalms, it's maybe takes 90 seconds and she's got tears in her eyes. She's right away moved. A man, have you ever seen a man to, to get him to cry while he's praying? You got to hit him over the head with a sledgehammer. Okay, it takes, it takes a lot of work. Okay. So the Gemara teaches, it's not my words, it's the Gemara. The Gemara says women have superior intention than men. Tractate Nita 45b, that's where you find that said. When Abraham doubted his wife's judgment, okay, back to Abraham and Sarah. Uh, we're talking about, you can read the whole thing in Genesis 21. I don't want to tell the whole story, but if we go back and listen to chapter 21 in Genesis, Abraham doubted his wife's judgment. So what does Hashem say to him? Hashem says to him, everything that Sarah says to you, hearken to her voice. Hashem says, Abraham, listen to everything she says to you. Well, Rashi tells us right there that Sarah had a greater power of prophecy than Abraham did. How do you like that? Abraham, our, our, our forefather, our first forefather, the first monotheist, the, the great, he destroyed, the, 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 he's called the Ivory, he's the first Hebrew. But with all that, his wife had a greater power of prophecy than he did. Now, so where does this come from? See, women, they have heightened emotional sensitivity, and this equips them with greater intuition. Guys, have you ever seen you brought some kind of prospective business partner home for dinner? 
And you think the guy's a nice guy and you plan on making a good business with him? And he leaves after dinner and your wife says to him, you're not doing business with that guy. So what do you mean? He's a good guy. Like, no, no, no. So what's wrong with him? I don't know, but you're not doing business with him. This is, wait, this is a sham talking through your wife. She's got these antennas. She's got the spiritual intuition and she sees stuff that her husband doesn't see. And her husband would be silly not to listen to her, not to heed her voice. What Hashem said to Abraham, hearken to her voice. Okay, because she senses things. She senses things a man can't. Sometimes she gets up in the middle of the night to for the baby. What's the matter? The baby's the, the, the baby's having trouble breathing. The baby's got stomach ache. Guys, he's fast asleep. He doesn't feel anything. She feels it. She feels it. She knows it. She, she's living. She's got that extra sensitivity. And for that extra sensitivity, a woman is capable of attaining a much higher spiritual level than a man can, unless a man really works hard. He's really got to work hard. He's got to have his head immersed in Torah and day and night. Now, two facts hold true to women's credit for posterity. Where do they get that? This is a credit. Women, now hear this. They did not participate in the golden calf. The golden calf was only by men. Women did not participate, number one. Number two, now hear this. Women did not participate in the sin of the spies. They didn't badmouth the land of Israel. They didn't say, no, we can't overcome the enemies. They didn't uh, have a, a lack of a moon and a shem. They listened to Moses. So the two biggest sins in Jewish history, the golden calf and the sin of the spies, women did not participate in those spies. Okay. So, so what, what, what happens? What happens when a, when a woman yells at her husband? Most time the husband yells at her back and it drew trace that violence just gets escalated. Wait a second. Let's look at, okay, guys, so your wife gives you some disparagement. Let's change your outlook. Okay. Now, upright women, they don't disparage their husbands. She's not looking to insult her husband. An upright woman, she respects her husband. She loves her husband. But if a woman is an upright Torah observant wife, Okay, she doesn't steal. <laughs> She's loyal. She doesn't badmouth other people. Uh, but yet, despite the fact that she's an upright woman, she does disparage her husband. It's the Almighty talking through her throat. Because the Gemara also tells us that the Almighty speaks through the throat of an upright woman. An upright woman, she's simply a microphone. So if you're listening to a lecture, and speaker's talking to the microphone, and you're getting the voice relayed to you, by the way, the speaker, and you don't like what's being said, do you throw tomatoes at the speaker or at the microphone, at the speaker system, at the microphone? No, it's the speaker, the, the human being is speaking. It's just when you, you, a, a man is upset at his wife for getting on his cage, he's, uh, it's like he's yelling at the microphone, he's angry at the microphone, okay? But she's just reflecting Hashem's voice. So instead of answering her, uh, instead of arguing with her, instead of trying to, to bully her, the husband should say what we call time out for chuva. Time out for chuva. We're going to take a time out for penance. Now we're going to do a little bit of self-assessment. And it really works. It really works. Because if you think Lisa Brody hasn't come home, and sometimes that he is married to a very upright woman, my Reb said, you think? What you're looking at me, it's not me. I'm just the fuselage. She's the engine. And I've got a very strong engine under, under the wings. That's my wife. Now come home and get the book thrown at me. At a clear blue. So wait a second. Wait a second. Hold it. Laser, you did something wrong. I said to her, you did, you know, I forgot something. Uh, I'll be home in an hour. I said, leave the home. Go take a walk. Okay, Hashem, where did I mess up? Where did I mess up? Oh, and I do self-assessment until I find something that I messed up in the last 24 hours and repent for it. And if I it, identify the problem, and if I do sincere penitence for the problem, I come home and she'll say, oh, I'm so sorry the way I spoke to you. No, that's, that's fine. She'll she'll be embarrassed. She'll be because this King Solomon says this in Proverbs. He says, Bilt sot Hashem dal ish when Hashem is pleased with a person's ways, even his adversaries will uh, recompense with him. They'll, they'll make up with him. So you see, when Hashem is pleased with, your, with, a, with a man's ways, and he makes tshuva, then he'll come home and he'll find out everything is hunky-dory. 
because that's the why his wife, if, if he didn't get that disparagement from his wife, he wouldn't have thought to, to make uh, to, to make self-assessment. Okay. So what you should do is take a walk, chill, be alone to go in a park, go in a backyard, go somewhere you could be alone. And then do the four steps of true, what I call the scar treatment, because a, a transgression blemishes the soul, puts a scar on the soul, and the scars make the soul dirty. It can't reflect divine light, can't reflect divine light. A person doesn't feel the closeness to Hashem. So what he does, that scar, S, he stops the bad behavior. No, he's not going to yell at him anymore. C, confesses to Hashem. What I did, oh, Hashem, maybe uh, I did something wrong today. Whatever, I did something wrong. I treated someone else wrong. And it's okay. Whatever he does, whatever he find, A, he apologizes to Hashem. And R, he resolves to do better. When he does that, he does those four steps. And he rectifies and it scars. It's, it's spiritual plastic surgery. It takes the scar off the soul. And he comes home. And that's really what got the wife aggravated. She wants a husband with a clean soul. That makes him beautiful. Right? That makes him handsome in her eyes. Okay, it's not because of a guy's uh, six-pack abs or his 20-inch biceps. And, no, or not because of his aftershave. It's because of his soul. A wife, an upright wife, she looks at your soul. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't want life. A husband looks messy or slovenly. What we say in Yiddish, a schlumper. She doesn't want that. But uh, she wants a husband with a shining soul that he's upright. Okay, so this is... With Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, everything we learn now out of the Torah and the Gemara comes Rabbi Nachman, and Rebbe Nachman summarizes it in one of his books in Sefer Midas. He writes a chapter about arrogance. The Sefer Midas is the, the book, of, uh, book of character traits. He says, if a person is arrogant, his wife will disparage him. So really, the source of the disparagement is the self, the fact that he becomes arrogant. Why? And that's easy to understand. Because a person that's arrogant can't be close to Hashem. If he acts in an arrogant manner, he's pushed away from Hashem. He's pushed away from Hashem. He has div less divine light. Her soul feels less illumination. And she gets upset. So why? She doesn't know. A lot of times a wife doesn't know how to explain what's bothering her. She'll nitpick at something. And a husband, he doesn't look at the source. He looks at, oh, you didn't pick up your socks. Why? Well, it's, it's a... They didn't pick up the socks. You call me all kinds of uh, bad names and this and that. No, she's just looking for something, but she doesn't know. Her soul is telling her. Her soul is this lighting these caution red lights and yellow lights and buzzers and bells. And, and she feels this in her soul and her brain. But she doesn't know what's really bothering her. So she tries to put some kind of label on it. Guys, don't listen. If we get upset, if our wives give us flack and they're upright wives, okay, if the wife's not upright wife and she speaks like a fishmonger, what can you do? Okay, just say, uh, Hey, listen, uh, you make tshuva and hope that your wife makes tshuva. But if you're married to a good woman, she's not going to disparage you for no reason. Okay, so Rebbe Nachman was a great grandson of the Holy Baal Shem Tov. Now, this is, all comes down to Baal Shem Tov's teachings also, because the Baal Shem Tov also teaches that a husband is responsible for the verbal abuse he gets from his wife. So to understand this principle, we have to understand the composition of the soul. Do you remember in our lessons in 13 Principles of Amuna, in the very beginning, I taught you about the three levels of the soul. The neshama, which is the highest level, the divine level. Then the intermediate level, the ruach, which is the spirit, which separates humans from animals. And the lower level, the nefesh, the basic animal spirit that all animals have. Okay, so we're going to talk about nefesh, ruach, and neshama. We have to understand the three levels of the soul to understand the soul correction that Hashem is giving us to take things above up level as if we are all spiritual physicians. Someone comes in and someone says to you, okay, uh, Dr. Eliza, Dr. Allen, Dr. Fumani, uh, Dr. Janice, Dr. Jennifer. And, okay, you come in, Dr. Julia, I need your help. Okay, so what? So you go, and you, so wait, so what's the problem? So I got disparagement at home. Okay. If we get disparagement, let's see what's going on in the soul. What's happening. Okay. So if you're a spiritual doctor, you look at what's going on in the soul. And now you look at the three levels of the soul. You have a sonogram in your office where you see the three levels of the soul, the nefesh, ruach, and neshama. Okay. The divine spirit, this uh, divine soul, the spirit, and the animal soul. Now, the bottom level of the soul, once again, nefesh, what's the basic animal soul? This is the lowest part of the soul, and it's housed at a person's liver, like we explained. You can go back and review this in the beginning of the 13 Principles of Amuna. Nefesh 
has the strongest connection to the body because the nephesh is permeates in the blood and it operates all a person's actions and all a person's bodily functions. Now, nephesh cannot perform any voluntary action unless it gets orders from above, from ruach and neshama, from the spirit, from the divine soul. Okay, uh, so you could say that nephesh is kind of like a robot. It's a robot. It's got to have somebody that moving it. The, the, the basic animal soul is a robot. Now, on the middle level is ruach. The middle level, that's the spirit. And this is said that ruach is in one's heart. Okay, so one's power of speech, which separates humanity from the animal kingdom, uh, this is rooted in ruach. Ruach also includes a person's emotions like love and hate. Therefore, love and hate relationship and speech are so deeply entwined. In other words, you know that uh, there's a thin line between love and hate, especially married people know that. You can have extreme love and it can turn around and then turn to be extreme hate. Okay, then now we're gonna go to the top level. The top level is neshama, that's the divine soul. And this again, what's a quick review. And this is housed deep, deep, deep inside the brain. So we say, nefesh is housed in the liver, ruach is housed in the heart, neshama, the divine soul, is deep in the brain. It's the tiny microchip in our brain. This is the life spark. This is the spark of divinity, the spark of the almighty, which is in every one of us. This is the reason that we have to love every single human being because every single human being is a Shashem instilled them with, with this divine spark. Okay, the difference between a live body and a dead body, that's the divine spark. That's it. Okay, so the Baal Shem Tov, he had a prime dis di disciple called the Toldus Yaakov Yosef, Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoy, buried in the Ukraine, had the privilege of being in his uh, holy grave site. Okay, so he writes, he wrote, much of the Baal Shem Tov's teachings that he got personally from the Baal Shem Tov. So Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoy writes in his classic book, Told Us Yaakov Yosef, Parshish Lechelcha, he gives an amazing eye-opening teaching. He says that if a husband commits transgressions in speech, we're talking about Hasidic thought and Kabbalah, which are the makeup, the anatomy of the soul, that if you want your MD in spiritual medicine, you got to know this. Okay, this is part of your... Your, your MD in spiritual medicine. Okay. If a husband commits transgressions in speech, say a husband curses, a husband slanders, a husband lies. He does something, some kind of, uh, some type of blemish, some transgression speech. Okay. Since his wife is so deeply entwined in her love-hate relationship with the soul, this is the ruach, part of his soul. And now he's done a blemish to ruach. And this is what really upsets his wife because any blemish in his speech, it creates a negative spiritual force that's reflected in his ruach, in his spirit. And she feels it right away because she's, that's, that's her, her main connection to him. Okay. And it manifests itself. Her reaction is going to manifest itself in this world as some type of verbal abuse. She's going to yell at him. She's going to be angry at him. Maybe she'll throw a rolling pin. Okay, guys, if she, if she yells at it's better than her throwing a rolling pin. Okay, be happy. Okay, she said maybe she has a bake because some guys encourage their wives to buy ready-made bread so they don't keep rolling pins in the house. Okay, but okay, don't want to get hit with the rolling pin. Be thank you that, uh, you know, sticks and stones. So what really happens when we look on our spiritual sonogram that his own transgression triggered her insolence and her disrespect of him and he has no one to blame but himself, says the Baal Shem Tov. So what does he do? Take stock in yourself. And this is a gift because Hashem wants you to take stock in yourself right now. Hashem doesn't want you to wait for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because you're not going to remember all these little things. So today, you know, you have this, a small pain, a headache. You go take an aspirin right away. You do something, you drink some water. You do something to relieve your headache. You can't fix a headache that you had uh, three months ago when you're on, on the eve of Rosh Hashanah already. Okay, so let's look at what the proper reaction of a verbally abused husband should be. Okay, the fact that many men are going to argue, and they do argue with these teachings, and bring them right out, that, that they argue with it, but that doesn't change the fact that uh, the Baal Shem Tov and his great grandson, Rabbi Nachman, doesn't change the fact that they knew exactly what they're talking about and they knew the workings of the soul, 
like we know the workings of our fingers even better. Okay, so husband with the slightest spiritual awareness, he's going to do everything to avoid escalation of arguments, avoid arguments altogether, and not to have any strife in his marriage. Because we'll soon learn that strife is if strife is terrible for income, because shalom bayit, marital peace and income they come down the same pipe. So when there is marital difficulty, then we're going to talk about this in the wife's responsibility. When there's marital difficulty, then there's less money at home. Okay, so if a wife yells or humiliates her husband, the best thing to do is to run to Hashem on the spot and do some serious self-reckoning. Okay, so if a husband repents for what he did or said wrong, he erases the blemish of his soul, as we explained, and his wife's going to be back to normal. All right, and we said, oftentimes a wife shouldn't even realize what's what's bothering her. And husband thinks she's nitpicking, but she can't explain these are things so deep in her soul. She doesn't know how to verbalize them. Okay, so maybe she's she, like I said, she's looking at the, the, the socks he left on the floor, or maybe the dish he didn't take to the sink. Okay, so fortunate is the husband, happy as husband, that realizes his wife's harsh and hurtful speech is simply a divine catalytic agent to induce self evaluation and shuva. So, this husband, husband like that, he's got spiritual awareness, he's going to have a peaceful home no matter what. Okay, so. We do it that. This is the true strength in a husband. Okay, so some guys they say to me that, uh, oh, I, I, can't, I can't shut up when, when she's her mouth is so nasty, it just run away and tear me up and down. I, I can't be, I can't be silent with such a verbal onslaught. So what they do, they join in the ruckus and it's a big brawl and it's a balagan, it's, it's chaos. So it, the husband knows, he knows, I never knew a husband to win an argument with a wife. You can't, can't do it. Okay, take it, guys. You cannot win an argument with her. Okay, she can outspeak you. She can argue you. Uh, if she's in the Harvard debating society, you're going to lose. And you're debating against her. Don't debate against another woman. Okay, maybe another man, that's all. All right, so what do guys do? Instead, they know they can't beat their wife. Internally, they know they can't beat their wife in arguments. They try to outmuscle her. They try to yell at her and they speak stronger, raise their voice, or heaven forbid, heaven forbid, raise a finger. That's really bad news. Okay, and much more. And they lose their self-control. And it takes a lot more self-control to keep one's mouth closed in face of a verbal onslaught than it does to chop through a, a stack of bricks. Uh, that, that, that's not real strength. Real strength is when, you, when a person can avoid an argument and a person can control himself and keep his mouth closed in the argument. Now, our sages... Also in a Gemara, they say a husband must be kind, humble, and never reign with terror over the members of his family. That means that anger is worse than pork. Okay, uh, what's more, they say the world stands on a person who curbs his tongue at the time of an argument. Okay, what is that? Excuse me, David, there's somebody that uh, check and see that everybody is uh, muted. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, husband's got to be kind, it's got to be humble. And the Good Morning Tractate Kulin says, you got to curb your tongue, time of argument. So the Rambam, this is the Rambam. This is religious law, Jewish religious law. He says that a husband must honor his wife more than he honors his own body and love her as he loves himself. And he should spend on her whatever he can afford, what he's financially capable of and not be a cheapskate. And he should speak to her gently, never in sadness or in anger. And this is in the Laws of Marriage, Hilchus Ishes, chapter 15, law 19 in the Rambam. So if a wife is transgressing religious laws, suppose the wife's doing something wrong. She's making a transgression of Torah. She's slandering someone and it's going against the laws of, of slander, Lashon, Lashon Hara. Okay, the husband does have the obligation to bring it to her attention. Sweetheart, uh, we're not supposed to do like that. Or this is, you know, the Chafetz Chaim says that this is forbidden. And if, but he doesn't object to a wrongdoing, then he's held responsible. This is where the Gemara rules that in Tractate Sh Shabbos. But nevertheless, as the Rambam stresses, uh, husband should still, even if he makes a little comment, he tread on eggs and very be gentle with her and never attack her dignity. Okay, the more he respects her, the more she'll have confidence and a serene soul. Okay, girls, don't smile too much because you're not absolved of responsibility. This is your responsibility. Now we turn the coin over and 
maybe the wife herself is a Torah scholar, and maybe she's familiar with the Baal Shem Tov's teachings. So now she thinks she's, oh, I'm an agent of Hashem. I'm a Catholic Hashem. I'm doing Hashem's will by blasting my husband, wiping the floor with my husband. So she willfully wipes the floor with the husband. She thinks she's doing a favor by correcting his soul. Uh-uh, uh-uh, you don't have the right. Sorry, young lady. The Torah forbids verbal abuse and no one is allowed to initiate verbal abuse. You can't initiate verbal abuse thinking that you're doing your husband or someone else a favor because if someone chooses, see what happens when a, a wife, in the case of a husband that did transgression, it's like a bolt of lightning and what comes out of her mouth, uh, does she put it in there? But if a wife chooses to be the punishing rod for her husband, oh, she's going to be punished because the Gemara tells us that Hashem lets a liable person be the punishing rod. In other words, that the person deserves punishment anyway, but now they've got more of a reason to throw the book at them. Okay, so the Gemara reminds us that Hashem, punish, that Hashem channels punishment by way of guilty people that they already deserve to be punished. So wife should never, never, ever willfully uh, use a whip of any kind, verbal or otherwise, against her husband, because you're not your husband's execu executioner. Now, that sounds like a hard word, executioner, but the verbally abusive wife, you know what she does? She murders her self husband's self-confidence, she murders his joy, and she murders the family's income. Now, many women complain that their husband don't have enough money. I get letters like this all the time. Okay, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says like this. He says, a woman, if she woman curses her husband, heaven forbid, she's going to end up in poverty. Rabbi Nachman makes a statement, boom, right? Like that's a statement of fact. And this also in Sefer Midas, the book of character traits, and about money on, on clause 32. So person said, how can this be? How can uh, she lose the money? Because uh, the Gemara in Tractate Bab Messiah says that a husband's income is by virtue of the wife. But even though it's by virtue of the wife, he's the spiritual conduit that the divine influence flows through. And so it's like a keeping that pipe clean is, is like a flow of fresh water. So when the wife disparages the husband, she disparages the pipe of abundance. She makes like pipe like a rusty pipe or a dirty pipe or a clogged pipe. And when he doesn't get the when when he doesn't get the, the abundance, it could very well be her fault. And even if the uh, the wife is the breadwinner and the husband learns or the husband is a, is a uh, uh, what do they call him? He's at the home. He takes care of the children. He's a, he's a domestic husband. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because spiritually, because they make up their souls, that he is going to be the pipe to bring down the abundance. Okay. So the happier the wife is, the better the family's income. Now, the husband would go back to you the Rebbe Nachman teaches us in the first part of Likotei Moran, Discourse 69, that a family's income comes from the illumination of a wife's soul. What's the illumination of a wife's soul? When she's happy. She feels, and Moon is great for illumination. Okay, she has, she, she's happy. She's happy with her circumstances, she's happy with her life. And if a wife is happy with her husband, she's going to be happy with her life. And it doesn't no matter what, doesn't matter how much or how little they have. They can have an adequate income. All right. So the more the wife's soul is illuminated, then the bigger bucks they're going to have. And the less happy she is, the less bucks. Well, maybe you could say, oh, I know people that don't have a good marriage, but the guys that are oh, making all kinds of money, this and that. Well, maybe you see the Rolls Royce that he's driving. That's not his. It's a lease. You don't know whether he's got that. Uh, it's a leased car. Or, you know, on a, on a 12 month contract or whatnot, you don't know the money owes in the banks. No one knows what's going on behind closed doors. But categorically, for a family to have a no debt income and an adequate income, then husband and wife together have to pull together and keep the house free of spiritual garbage. Just like you don't want physical garbage on your kitchen floor. You don't want spiritual garbage in your living floor and your domain and have a home of peace. And a home of peace is going to be a home where there's abundance, abundance, okay? There's a lot more to say in that, but we go on to a second part, verbal abuse from parents. And this is really where I get a lot of mail from, even more than marriage, 
about even adults, we're talking about adults, adult kids that have adult older parents. And even though the kids are married already and they, they get disparagement from the parents or the kids are after university, they're, they're adults already and they get disparagement from the parents. Okay, so ask yourselves a question. What's the greatest gift that the Almighty could give somebody? Give a child. It says the, the most painful letters I get, I get see my, my mailbag, it's, it's, it's pretty big. Okay, but the most painful letters I get are from families that have been married three years, five years, six years, 10 years, don't yet have children. Rabbi, pray for us, we should have children, give us a blessing. What can, what can we do? What can we do to, to induce a blessing for, for children? It's just so, so, so. And they get people that have children and complain about the children. Who did? There is no greater blessing in life, even if you have one child. One child is the difference between being a parent, not being a parent. Okay, after that, you have 20 children, that's fine. Okay, there's, there's a family here in Kfar Chabad. They've got 22 children. Okay, this is a, 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 from the Lubavitcher Rebbe's family, also called Shneir. So 22 kids. Okay, you could fish, they have their, I, I was in their home and their dining room table looks like a military barracks. They have, they cook with these great big pots and a really long table. Okay, but it, it says a blessing. Children are blessing. That the biggest blessing you can have is when the Almighty takes one of his exquisite souls and Gives it for safekeeping to a parent. So you ask yourselves, there's the greatest gift that the Almighty can give anybody. And so why do people abuse it? Why do people abuse their children? Well, there's five major reasons why parents are verbally abusive. The first, the parents grew up themselves in abusive homes. And in their efforts to cope and survive, they become verbally abusive themselves. The second reason, that the parents have low self-esteem. And, and they seek to build themselves up by stepping on their kids. They know they feel like little people outside the home, but they feel at home they could trample their kids and, and they could do, they, 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 this makes them feel better because they feel themselves lousy. People that are abusive often, nine times out of 10 have very low self-esteem. Three, the parents never learned how to educate according to Torah. And they never learned the seriousness of the Torah's prohibition on verbal abuse. Now, children are human beings. And children have the right to protection of Torah, just like a stranger at Torah. People that say, the kids are not yours. You can't do with the kids what you want. It's safekeeping. They, say, they belong to the Almighty. They don't belong to you. Okay. So for parents that when they're concerned about their own prestige, more than they're concerned about their children. Okay. They have expectations that their children cannot fill. Suppose the father was a frustrated football player. He never made on the football team. So he wants his son to be a football player. Son wants to play the violin. He don't want to play football. He wants to play the violin. Okay, so no, the father wants it. He's got to play on Manchester United or he's got to be on Real Madrid. Son wants to be on the, the Madrid Philharmonic. He don't want to play for Real Madrid. Okay, so, so now he's got, son's going to be frustrated twice. He's never going to be the football player that his father wants. And then he's never, he's not going to pursue his music career that he wants. But the father, he doesn't care about the happiness of the son. He's worried about his own, his own esteem and his own dad. And he wants to have a son who's a professional football player. And it's all the time he helps, all the time abusing the son. So when the children fail to attain this parent's goal, not their own, this parent's goal, the parents, they're frustrated and they voice their frustration by verbally abusing the child. The fifth reason that parents they have a uniform standard for all the children. They think that the children should be, you know, little German soldiers with the marching and now children, each one is a different neshama. Just because a child is born into a same family, you know, you have kids and brothers. I know in, in our family, in our family, six kids, everyone is so different, so different, even on the different ends of the earth and doing completely different type of things. You know, we, we all love each other, but Hashem, but everyone is so completely different. It doesn't matter. So maybe you've got the same spiritual DNA, but you certainly don't have the same uh, spiritual DNA, have the same physical DNA from mom and dad. But the spiritual DNA comes from Hashem. And we all come here for our own soul correction. We all have our own mission on earth to do. So parents, you can't expect to have a, a, a same thing. This is that, okay, the kids, all my kids, they should have, maintain a 90 average at school. Well, wait a second, maybe, uh, maybe little Johnny has only got a 75 average in school. But Johnny's much more kind and considerate than his brothers and sisters are. And maybe Johnny's uh, so much better. He's a, he's a fantastic artist. 
and maybe these kids get all types of other qualities than other kids. You don't put Johnny on the same on the same uh, level that that Mary and Susie are. Okay, Mary and Susie are good little girls. They come home with ninety fives on their tests, and Johnny comes home with seventy fives. Parents yell at him. They no, wait a second. Okay, so instead of looking at the twenty five points he got off, look at the seventy point five points he got right. But his parents, why do they look at the bad points of their kids instead of looking at the good points? Oh, you got an 80 on the test. You got 80% of the questions answered right. No, you got 20% of the chance are wrong. Okay, sir, how would you like if your boss evaluated like that? Your boss comes with criticism. And you say, but I made all these great sales. No, but you missed this sale and you missed that sale. Oh, you talk about the two sales I missed. What about the eight great sales I made? Sir, you just did that to your son last night when he came up with the report card. Oh, so they got the double standard. When his boss says that's to hit him, he doesn't like it. When he does it to his children, but that's okay. He says, oh, because they're my children. No, they're not your children. They're Hashem's children. Okay, and you have a right to protect that soul. And you have a right to preserve that soul's joy for living. So there's a joie de vivre. Okay, so a parent must never abuse a child verbally or otherwise. Now, fear and disparagement they are the worst types of verbal abuse. Father says, my parents have to, my, my, my children have to respect me. The Gemara tells a story about a little boy in Bnei Brak, talking about something we're talking about uh, 1,700 years ago. And what was the little boy's sin? He wasn't careful at the dinner table and he broke a glass. He broke a glass. And the father roared at him. And the father says, wait and see the punishment you're going to get from me. The kid was so terrorized, he ran out of the house and he found a big pit and he jumped and committed suicide. It's a Gemara. True story. Right out of the Gemara. When a child is terrorized, the first, the worst thing a parent could do is to threaten a child. Okay, either you could say it's not such a big deal and be quiet and you want to punish him, punish him on the spot. But to keep a child with terror when is the axe going to fall down on my head? That's called in Torah. That's that's a, a it's an Inuya Dean. When they put a person in death row and they don't tell them where they killed. Okay, you're going to get killed. When? No. Every single moment is terror. But at the punishment and when the punishment and what's the punishment? Okay, but even so, we're, we're not for so we're in favor of punishment. We're in favor of education. I don't know about punishment. Punishment doesn't teach. Education does teach. Okay, but even if your father you want to punish, punish on the spot. Punish on the spot. To, to scare a child, scare a child. Child loses his joy in life that is killing a child. And if you're not killing a child physically, it's killing a child spiritually because it's stealing the child's joy of life. And that's it. And you can say a, a, story, a story about, uh, he's one of the classic examples. Charles Schultz, he must have been uh, the, the guy that invented peanuts. You remember peanuts? He had this character uh, called Pigpen. And Pigpen was this little dirty boy. And nobody knew his real name. But they called him Pigpen. Everybody called him Pigpen. And you know, who knows that, how hurtful that was. But they walked around dirty and unshoveled all, all day long. Let me ask you a question. If a kid gets a label by this way, this is another express example. Last week, I told you that the Gemara cannot possibly list all the different types of verbal abuse. But it does say our nickname is forbidden. If that child's name is David and a parent calls him Pigpen or in Yiddish Schlumper, she said we're before, okay, if you call a kid a Schlumper and the, the kid means dirty and disheveled, kids call him a Schlumper, call him Pigpen enough times, he's going to believe that he's a Pigpen. Don't expect him to take his clothes to the laundry basket. Don't expect him to fold his clothes. Don't expect him to hang up his clothes. And you can't expect his bedroom to be a mess and to have the, you know, the dirty, <laughs> I stuff some bits of pieces of, of 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 old food, of old chocolate wrappers, and and all kinds of scraps of food from from three weeks ago because that disappearing. Good label, put a negative label on a child. Negative label on a child. It's terrible. You know, terrible horror stories about children that uh, they, they, they could go one by just. But don't call to it. It's forbidden in Torah, and because it leaves a child with the worst emotional scars, really worse emotional scars. Okay, so we can't expect little David to be nice and neat and clean uh, if his parents call him pig pen. And sometimes, I don't want to a real painful story, real painful story. 
guy that served with me in my army unit. And people that didn't know this guy, that oh, he's so dear, he's so courageous. And inside, you know, we know the guy made dumb chances. He did. He he gambled. He took big gambles. He did dangerous stuff. But uh, Shem helped him, and and he succeeded. But it's things that you don't do, take unnecessary chances. And once in a late midnight, if you because your brothers in arms, you really get close. And once he revealed to me that when he was ten years old, these two twelve-year-old bullies beat him up and he came home he was crying 10 year old crying two 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 guys older than him bigger than him they beat him up and the father said did you fight back and he says that they one held me and the other beat me i couldn't fight back they're bigger than me plus you didn't fight back you're a coward wow father you're a murderer you almost murdered that kid. this 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 child had a death wish he figured this listen if i get killed on a mission i'm a hero Okay, so I'm a hero and nobody can say I'm a coward. All right, because I'm in a combat unit. My father was in a combat unit like this. And if I don't get killed and I take this really big chance and I, I, I get, get the mission done, I'm a hero. So I'm a, it's a win-win situation. All right, his death wish is a win-win situation. He doesn't care about he get killed because here he is in his 20s as a soldier in, in a good infantry unit. And there's plenty, no, no lack of, you know, in Israel, there's there's no lack of chances to for, for, for combat, at least in, in our history. Okay. And his father, death wish. Because at age 10, one time, father called him coward. And this is not like the pig pen, the parents call him pig pen all the time. Father, one time, this pierced his heart, an arrow that pierced his heart. Parents, watch your mouths. Watch your mouth, a mouth. Is a word of the mouth is a bullet and a bullet you don't know where it can hit right in the heart and it can murder a child's soul and bring it to a point of such extreme behavior i'll give you another story another story a young lady that was sent to me for counseling and her parents complain that uh she was off the track of observing judaism and this and that and uh Father came home from work and saw the girl in a little too much makeup that their group, oh, the so girls sorry. that grow up in their group, are, are allowed to have. And he said, get the makeup. And they said, get the makeup off. And then he said, excuse the expression. He called her a slut. Oh, what are you calling? An observant girl learns a base Yaakov? You call her S-L-U-T? That's it. It did the same thing that it did the guy that was 10 year old by car. This was talking, the young lady was 17. Well, after he said that, okay, if my father calls me that, I'm going to learn exactly what it's all about and I'm going to have a good time. And then it was party time. This let all the horses out of the, out of the barn. At the office, they're, they're all running free. Okay. Father, you're a murderer. You're a murderer. Hold it. Why not sit down with your daughter and say, sweetheart? Do you believe in Hashem? Yes, no. Okay, yes or no. If you do, then, then let's open up 13 principles of Muna. Let's open up three words of Muna. Let's open up divine direction. Hashem is with us every month. Do you do believe, you know, to get across the street, you have to have Hashem with us. Uh, do you know what happens to the divine presence when there is something unsightly? And explain to it. Explain to it kindness, kindness. I'll tell you something, there's a, the Melissa Rebbe, my Rebbe, he is a great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. And there's a Hasidic custom that they never kiss and hug their daughters. Never kiss and hug their daughters. But the way he speaks to his daughters, the daughters have such love and reverence for their father. I see this. Unbelievable. And your father's, you know, the daughters, all get, the daughters don't respect because it's the way if a parent the love and respect you give your child, this is what you're going to get back. And for a man, and this a man himself, man himself from a, a Hasidic family, a Hasidic background, to use such a word against his own daughter? Okay, how would you like if Hashem used that? Okay, how about if uh, every time, sir, you look at a woman other than your wife, Hashem called you a, uh, 
I don't want to say it, but when Hashem called you an equivalent word that you called your daughter, you wouldn't like that. And if Hashem judged you like that, you wouldn't like that. So you have a double standard, a different standard for yourself, a different standard for your children. That is not education. And I'll tell you one thing. Kids have fantastic radar for hypocrisy. The moment there is not the same standard, the moment there's a double standard, they're not going to listen to parents. Because if you don't live it, you can't give it. The way to educate our kids is by personal example. And that's it. So that is, uh, when we tell the, the verbally abused child, the verbally abused, we know of a verbally abused child and a child is underage, which means under the age of bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, uh, the best thing you could do is to get a hold of the parent's spiritual guide, the parent's rabbi, the parent's whatever, it, and say that maybe you could talk to the parents about that. There's something, this is something critical. And it's saving a life. And if the rabbi or the spiritual guide has got his heads up, then he'll find a way to speak to that. And if the child is an adult, then to understand, I know one thing for an, for an adult that uh, the Torah says, what is the Torah? The Torah requires me to, re to honor my parents. Okay, you're quiet to honor your parents, yes. And you can't answer your parents. You can't, even if they yell at you, you know, that, that the Gemara says that even if uh, a parent takes our wallet with all our money in it and throws it in the ocean, we can't say anything bad to the parent. Okay, but if the parent is chronically verbally abusive, to, to honor our parents, we don't have to be masochists. So the way a person can exercise honor of parents is to pray for the parents, pray for the parents, and you don't have to expose yourself to a verbally abusive individual, even if it's a parent. Okay, but then they don't take this as a blanket license to cut off. You have to ask your own rabbi, your own spiritual guide with your own particular circumstance. But this is just in, in general. Okay, that's as far as that. All right, so uh, why does this happen? Okay, now we're talking about verbal abuse from one's children. We talked about verbal abuse from one's wife that comes from Ruach. Verbal abuse from one's children. What happens when your children are insolent and your children are very cheeky with you? And the children don't speak to you properly. Back to the Baal Shem Tov's teachings, the Baal Shem Tov tells us that conception begins in the brain because the seed, the source of the seed comes from the brain. That's why the, the seed has also, we mentioned, physical DNA and it has spiritual DNA. The spiritual DNA in the seed, okay, it comes from Hashem, but that's by way, by way of the soul of the parent. Not as affected. We're warned very, very carefully, very stiffly. You know, people look at uh, the, they say you know sex, and it gives a connotation of sex. In Torah, Torah observance, no sex. It's procreation. It's marital gratification. And it's a very holy thing. And when the divine union called divine union. It's a, the, the conjugal union is something very, very holy. And a person should treat the wife, the wife, the husband, in the highest respect, the highest holiness, and just a pure love. That they shouldn't be together if there's not pure love between them. When they do things uh, behind closed doors, the way the Torah says, they, they keep it not lewd in, in, in very proper fashion they bring a high neshama. But sometimes a guy, let's see, he's been looking at the wrong things and he's been looking at the wrong media and been reading the wrong magazines. And he's got these lewd pictures in his brain and he's fantasizing that he's with his wife with someone else. Wow. It's going to bring, this is such a blemish on neshama. This is going to influence the child. And same thing with the wife. If your husband is maybe a little bit overweight, a little punchy, and she's been you know, looking at these bodybuilders or whatever, and she's fantasizing in her mind, ooh, bad neshama. And then they grow up, and the kid is going to have a terrible disposition and very insolent, very cheeky. They're going to yell at the kids. Mom and dad, it's your fault. It's your fault because it's your blemish of your divine soul that brought down this blemished soul. Okay, so really, mom and dad, this, this is... They created their own problem. And this is teaching Baal Shem Tov. Also, the Arizal talks about this, the Holy Ari, of Yisrael Ashkenazi. And the 
for example, it's a Torah. People think, oh, this is prudish guarding the eyes. The Torah and uh, Numbers chapter 15, verse 39 says, Lotatu, you can guard your eyes. Hey, guard your eyes. But you look at that one. Ooh, mister, if you look at another woman and you take that vision when you're together with your wife, you are in big trouble. You are in big trouble. If you can't clean out your brain and clean out your eyes, it's better to tell your wife that you're, you're tired or something and, you know, delay it till the next day. But the image of a woman other than your wife in your brain, it's terrible. Because in transgression, there's three levels of transgression. There's transgression deed, which corresponds to the nefesh. There's transgressions in speech that corresponds in ruach. And there's transgressions in thought, which corresponds to nefesh. Well, guy says, well, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't touch her. But the fact that you've got her in your brain that is like adultery in your neshama, in your divine soul. That's why we're not supposed to look at other women. I'm not, you don't have to image your wife in your brain. It's not prudish. This is basic, basic spiritual health. Again, if you're a spiritual doctor and you take a person, a person's got all kinds of problems and all kinds of difficulties. Hey, look at the look at the viruses and, and look at the spirit, the spores that, that you've got in your brain. It's just like viruses and spores and bacteria and clean it out. How do you clean it out? Clean out with shuva. And these are things when the bad kids, the bad kids, there's no such thing as bad kids. There's bad parents, they're bad parents. And it all begins way before the kids are born. And the child education begins nine months before the children are born. Okay. So even if a parent does harbor some kind of forbidden thoughts, and the guy said, well, what am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do now? Okay, I didn't know all the stuff back then. So what happens? Okay. Shuva, penitence, it purifies the soul. Now, one thing when you have, this is we're talking spiritually, the spiritual waves in a family, the vibes, the atmosphere, when a parent does shuva, a parent makes penitence, this has a quantum effect on the children. So even if the child speaks in an unsightly manner, if the mom and dad never use epithets, mom and dad never use four-letter words, mom and dad always speak upright, that's the atmosphere in the home. And a kid will learn that, that uh, hey, this is not the way we speak in our household. And say, mom and dad are allowed to say with a smile on their face, yes, Danny, Susie, this is not the way we speak in our household. Not yell, that's it. Once, twice, they're not going to speak like that anymore. Not to speak like him because if we're the what does the Gemara say? That the deeds of parents are stepping stones for the child for the children. Okay, so that's the one thing that can't say that somebody that doesn't say categorically, it's not categorically the parents are at fault because now we have a different cause that cause insolence, even in great homes with great parents. Okay, so you're not necessarily, it's not a hundred percent. Let's say 50%. At least 50% is problems out in the street. That's bad news. When a person's children are in the street and not at home, then the outside influences have a profound influence on a child's behavior. And depends, we say, check out the kids' friends, who their peers are. Uh, because in this age, Gamora says it, this is the age of Mashiach's arrival. We're expecting Mashiach any moment. And therefore, uh, heresy and insolence are doing everything to declare war against holiness. So the more a child is exposed to street values, and what are the street values? That's the values of the media. That's the values of TikTok. That's the values of uh, uh, social social media, Instagram. You don't want your kids learning character traits from TikTok and Instagram. There's like all kinds of lewd stuff there. And the more they influence by TikTok and Instagram, and not by Abaya and Rova, the Chavetz Chaim and Sarah Schneer, then the more they're going to be heretical and insolent. It's a, so our, far, our, our sages were really farsighted. They saw deep in the future. And they said, listen to this, what they say, the sign of messianic days. This is the Gomorrah tractate, Sota 49. A son insults a father, a daughter rises against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies are the members of his family. This is a sign of the days of Mashiach. 
Elijah the prophet, Elio Navi says in the Midrash of Elio Navi, Tan of the Baalio, he says that in the generation when the son of David shall come, lads disparage elders. Okay, so it's a sign of Mashiach. So in order to combat the influence of the street, uh, parent and the home has to be immersed in Torah and in charitable deeds because a parent that fails to teach kids loving kindness, good deeds, upright, that the Torah values, uh, it's going to have a problem. It's going to yield to the street. If the street is stronger than the home, then they'll yield to the street. Now, the best way to educate, once again, to educate children is for us to educate ourselves, to strengthen ourselves in Torah and in charitable deeds. And with our strengthening in Torah and Amun and charitable deeds, we should take ourselves into the high holidays and have the very best high holidays we ever did in a wonderful New Year 5783 with all our hearts wishes for the very best. God bless on name. Thank you.